Hey everyone, so this perception video uh, covers a couple of major topics. Uh, one of those is about how your brain um, actually sees motion and has the illusion of motion even when the motion isn't either there or is not exactly what the brain thinks it is. Um, so it's just another example of brain tricks that can be played on your um, very vulnerable brain. Uh, I'm also going to talk real quickly about some rules or laws that your brain knows to be true when it looks at things in the environment that it tries to apply, uh, similar to like basic laws of physics in terms of what it knows to be true about stuff that it's seeing. And then I'm also definitely going to be covering um, the idea that your brain has a unique algorithm that separates all of us um, in terms of how our brain chooses to organize and interpret information, which most of the time, you know, we are on the same page, but sometimes we're not. And I'm going to end this one with a couple of examples and also talk about the amazing phenomenon known as pareidolia. Um, if it is a full moon tonight and a clear sky as you are watching this video, uh, please feel free to look outside at the moon. And if you see a face, if you see the man in the moon, congratulations, you have just experienced pareidolia. If you don't, if it's not a full moon, or it's not nighttime, or it's not a clear sky, feel free just to go look at your electrical outlet, and you should notice that your two outlets have a face. You should see two eyes and a mouth. Uh, the American outlet is much sadder looking than the European outlets. So let's go back up here and talk about this. Uh, so motion perception is the idea that sometimes your brain creates the illusion of fictitious movement where the movement actually isn't taking place, but because the brain either cannot perceive it any differently or because the brain can only um, process information so quickly, uh, this is a way to take advantage of the brain's vulnerability to incoming information. Uh, there are essentially three types of motion illusions that I need you to know. Uh, definitely do not want to get them mixed up with each other. I will give examples of all three of them. So one is called the five phenomenon. Uh, the five phenomenon is when you have a series of light bulbs or series of lights, series of lit pixels that in close proximity to one another go off in a repeated fashion that because they go on and off rapidly one after another in such a repeated, um, very predictable movement and pattern of close proximity, it gives the brain the inability to notice that these are going on and off separately. So instead, the brain basically, your brain follows the lights as if they're actually moving around and they see it as one continuous bulb or one continuous movement when in reality it's just a series of individual lights that are firing in rapid succession. So one good example of this is a old school theater movie marquee. So if you have like the old classic white sign with black letters in some like 1960s, 1970s movie theater on the outside of the building, and then around it is a bunch of light bulbs. And then what they do is the light bulbs will fire on and off back to back to back and they'll go all and basically it looks like it's dancing all around the sign again and again and again. Another good example of this are running Christmas tree lights and another one would be something and I believe I have this uh, in the description below. I have uh, a link to one of these is the um, uh, news stickers like the external um like city street newspapers, such as the one that you see at Wall Street, uh, the one that you will see uh, in Times Square in New York, you'll notice that you know the sign is really just a series of light bulbs, and then they put words on the screen, and it makes it look like the words are scrolling, you know, usually from right to left. But in reality, that's not what's happening. What's happening is all of the bulbs are lit up to make words, uh, and then they flick them off, and then they merely shift them by one and flick them back on again. They do it in such rapid succession, it makes it look like the words are crawling, scrolling across the screen. That is the five phenomenon. And your brain, the only way you would notice that this is happening is if you were uh, to take a video of this and then watch it in slow-mo, and you would see that the lights are individualized. Otherwise, your brain just kind of sees them together because your brain can't perceive it fast enough. Uh, another example is what's called the stroboscopic effect. Now, take everything I just said about the five phenomenon and just replace the word lights with images, and now you have the stroboscopic effect. So the stroboscopic effect, good examples of this, 
are things such as cartoons and claymation, any kind of animation, movie reels, DVDs, flip books, all are examples of the stroboscopic effect. If you've ever made a flip book, think about what happens. You know, you have a series of often dozens, if not hundreds of images that are drawn over and over again with slight differences between them. And if you go through them one at a time, you'll notice that there's a herky-jerky motion because you'll see the shift, you'll see the change. However, if you take them all and you just run through them and riffle through them really fast, it gives the illusion of movement as opposed to the, the, the jerkiness of it all. And that is because your brain cannot um, fill in the discrepancy fast enough. And so it goes ahead and shifts it from point A to point B under the assumption that it actually did it in a fluid motion when in reality it didn't. So, for example, if you were watching a DVD or a Blu-ray, you know, just pause it. And then just go one slide, one screen at a time, uh, and one after another after another, you'll notice it's a very slight but noticeable jerky motion. And that is now, but then when you hit play again, it is normal, as long as there is enough frames per second, um, which I think is usually around like 40 to 60 frames a second, you would never notice the difference because the brain can't fill them in. This, again, this is how cartoons work. This is how uh, claymation works. You know, claymation is a tedious process. You know, they, they have the clay models, then they take a picture of them, then they move them slightly, take a picture of them, move them slightly, take, and then they have to do that over and over and over and over again. And then when they run back the pictures quickly, it gives the illusion that they're moving in these nice fluid motions, but in reality, they're not. Uh, if you need a simple example of the stroboscopic effect, uh, just take something right now, such as your pen or a pencil, and just take it out in front of your face and wave it back and forth really quickly. And you'll notice that not just where the pencil or pen is, but also where it has been for the last several hundreds of a second before that, you will see blurs, you will see a vapor trail of that image. And that is because your brain is constantly following it, but it can't keep up with the motion as quickly as it occurs. As a result, you're seeing the, 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 the basically the remaining images from uh, the previous spot. And so you're actually watching. So if you, if you do it really fast, you can basically see the pencil where it is, but you can also see every other spot where the pencil was simultaneously because of the stroboscopic effect. Uh, I would show. I do have a video or a couple of videos in the description below. Again, I would love to show those videos uh, on uh, this um, this this uh, video that I'm doing. But as soon as I show any kind of videos, uh, it'll immediately get shut down uh, because of copyright issues. So I don't. I will link them below. Please check them out. They are fascinating. They're also very quick and informative. Uh, I will show you an example of what's called the autokinetic effect. Uh, this, this is an example of the autokinetic effect, hopefully. There you go. So this is actually a still image. So hopefully you can see this. Uh, hopefully it's large enough on your screen. Uh, this is actually a still picture. This is not a video. However, if it looks like the inner and outer boxes are kind of moving or jiggling or kind of bouncing a little bit back and forth, uh, that is the autokinetic effect. So the autokinetic effect uh, what they f they find is that when you have a spot of light, or in this case, multiple spots of light, and you have an especially different contrast, so especially like a white light with a complete black background, that's why often a star will show the autokinetic effect, is because the brain... It's not, there's nothing wrong with your eyes, and there's nothing wrong with your brain. It's the fact that your brain often will use light... Uh, and it has to use a reference point. And so when there aren't any reference points, your brain basically can't figure out where to, like where that light is meant to be. And so it starts to move and it starts to shake or it starts to kind of rotate, but it's not actually moving at all. It is possible to do the autokinetic effect with something as simple as take a, you know, just sit in a pitch black room and take like a laser pointer and, you know, just make sure that it stays on and then just set it on like the table and point it at the wall. If you stare at it for a few seconds, it should start to move, even though obviously it's not moving at all. Um, again, it's an interesting phenomenon, um, but there's nothing wrong with your eyes. There's nothing wrong with your brain. It, it has to do with the perceptual idea. All right. So let's talk about perceptual constancy. So these are three simple duh rules that your brain uses to try to make sure it understands that 
you know, when you obviously are moving around and sometimes you're closer to things, sometimes you're farther away, sometimes you see them from one angle, sometimes you see them from another, it doesn't actually change the the object. It doesn't change the idea. So it's called shape constancy, size constancy, and sometimes I've seen it called brightness constancy or light or color constancy. And so uh, all three of them are rather simple, uh, pretty straightforward, but one of them is what's called shape constancy. And shape constancy basically says just because you now may be looking at this from a different angle than you were previously, the object itself has not actually changed shape. So if you're looking you know, at your car from the front and then you look at it from the side, it has not changed shape. You're just looking at it from a different perspective or angle, but you know that the car hasn't changed. Uh, one of the examples you'll see in like every psychology textbook ever is in a door. So obviously, if you look straight at like a closed door, it may look like a rectangle. But if you open it up, it now it looks more like a trapezoid. And then eventually, you can get it so it looks like a thin piece of strip of wood. Obviously, the door itself has never changed shape at all. You're just changing your perspective of it. So, but the brain knows that the thing hasn't changed, so it has shape constancy. Another example is what's called size constancy. You know, if you know, uh, if you see that your friend parked on the, for some reason parked way on the other side of the parking lot, and you see their tiny little car, and you you barely can see them, and they're very small, you know that your friend is still five foot six or whatever, and their car is normal size. If you are flying over your house, and you look down, and you see this tiny, you know, little house, you know it's because you might be 30,000 feet in the air, not because your house is tiny. You know your house is the same size it's always been. So that is called size constancy. So just, you know, you take a ball and you throw it away from you and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's not actually doing that at all. And you know that to be true. So that's called size constancy. And then the last one is what's called brightness constancy. And so brightness constancy, remember in the video that I showed or I talked about your eyes and how your cones are responsible for detecting acuity, sharpness, and color. But the problem with them is that at nighttime or when it's dim, your cones basically become non-responsive. So if you are, you know, standing in the parking lot on a bright sunny day and you look at your bright red sports car, it's a bright red sports car. However, if you, you know, look at your car in a dimly lit garage at dusk, that car might look a lot more muted. The color might look faded. Uh, but you know that that has not happened. You know that there is nothing wrong with your car in terms of the color. It's just your inability to see it that way currently because of the lack of available light waves coming off of it, not because the car has changed. So obviously, unless something has actually been bleached, unless something has actually faded due to sunlight exposure or something like that, you know that just because you can't maybe see it with the color or vibrancy that you can at other times, you know that thing hasn't actually changed. If you see, like, for example, um, uh, you know, like, obviously not nowadays, but if you saw, like, an old Polaroid that was taken in the 1970s, and you look at it, and you see, you know, that it's, you know, kind of faded, and the colors have become muted, and kind of, you know, dungy and brown, you know that those were not like that at that time, and so your brain can kind of assume the constancy of the colors that it would have been. Okay, just like if you mess around with a photo you took with Instagram filters, you know that you're purposely changing it, but you know that the actual color obviously remain constant. So that's called brightness constancy. All right, so the last thing then is this little um, uh, area right here. And so um, a perceptual set is a fancy way of saying you have a way of looking at the world or perceiving the world because of what you have been through. So you have lived your life. No one has lived your life but you. No, no one has experienced exactly what you've experienced. No one has taught you exactly what you've been taught. No one has learned or have experienced or have done the things you have done. You are unique. As a result of that, you have what is called a perceptual set. Now, when you and I look at the same things, most of the time, our perceptual sets will go to the same place. And most of the time when you see things or hear things or experience things, most of the time we will land on the same interpretation of data. 
But our brain, because again, we have memories, we have learned things, we have experiences, no one have lived your life but you, so your brain operates on its own unique algorithm, like your own, your brain is basically its own learning machine, and as a result of all that years of learning, all that years of experience, your brain is biased, I've talked about this in other videos, again, I don't mean bias in a negative way, I just mean that your brain is biased to perceive the world based on the way that you have grown up and lived, and that's why I refer to perceptual set as your mental predisposition. You are predisposed to seeing the world a certain way. Again, most of the time, we're on the same page, but every once in a while, you will get an example. Um, some of them are obviously more serious than others, but using a silly example that also went viral, uh, I always resort back to the whole dress uh, that went viral. For some, you know, we all look at the same exact picture. Everyone looked at the same photo, but about half of the population saw it as a white gold dress, like I did, and about half of the population saw it as a black blue dress. And if you're on one side or the other, it may seem rather inexplicable to you. Oh my goodness, how can you see it as white gold because it is totally black blue? Or, oh my god, how can you hear that as, um, uh, how can you hear that as Yanny? It's clearly Laurel, or whatever the case may be. So most of the time, like I said, we're on the same page, but especially if the information is either ambiguous, okay, that's where it really gets you, okay, when the information is ambiguous, it's kind of raw and kind of in a, a sweet spot of confusion, that is really when you get to see the differences in perceptual sets between people. Uh, let me show you this one right here. Um, so this one right here is an example of a dual-sided image. Now, when I showed you this image and you see this, I don't know, maybe you saw it as a seal first. Maybe you saw it as a donkey first. Um, does it matter which one? Again, here's the seal's head, and there's the flippers and their tail. Um, but the donkey, this is the ears, the eyes, and the nose. Um, is there a reason why you saw it one way or the other? No. Uh, just because of a, per a perceptual difference. So um, most people report seeing the donkey first. Uh, some people see the seal first. Does it really make any difference? No, but it is an example of a perceptual set. Also, I would like to point out many people when I say, hey, you know, did you see the donkey first? Like, well, I didn't see it as a donkey. I saw it as a rabbit or I saw it as a horse. Um, and that, again, that's interesting to me. Some people say they saw a deer. Uh, to me, it looks like a donkey. Some people are like, no, it's a deer, it's a bunny, or whatever. Or some people are like, I don't know what the heck any of you are talking about. It looks like a seal. Well, uh, and some people don't see anything at all for a while. Well, again, this is a perceptual set thing. Why, you know, I don't know what led me to see it one way over the other. But obviously we operate, we all saw the same thing, but we, we landed on something different. So that's an example of perceptual set. Uh, now, how did your brain organize all of this? The key word is schema. Now, if you think of the word schematic, you know, a schematic is like a blueprint for a building. So if you, you know, the, 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 bl the blueprints that were used to construct the building, that is a schematic. Uh, the way or the layout or the map of some kind of plan is a schematic. Well, what your brain does is um, uses the same techniques in the form of what we would think of as mental blueprints or mental mapping, and that is called schema. And so all of your brains, all of our brains, we do not necessarily organize things exactly the same way. Now, because there is a lot of overlap between which regions of our brains do which things and which cortexes and which neural clusters do the same things, we do tend to have a lot more in common than we don't. That certainly makes it easier for us to relate to each other. Uh, but at the same time, that doesn't mean we exactly, we don't exactly organize information the same way, in part because of what I talked about earlier, we haven't all learned the same things. We haven't all experienced the same things. We haven't all had the same things that have happened to us. As a result, we're not necessarily going to organize all the information the same way because we don't necessarily all have the same information. But even if we did, there is enough room for variety that we wouldn't all necessarily do it the same way. Now, let me give you two good examples of this. If I had all of you as a project invent like your dream home, you guys would all probably have some of the same basic features that we would all kind of expect and know from a home, but there would be a noticeable number of differences on how you chose to implement them and also what you added on top of that. 
another example of this would be, let's say I gave all of you a brand new, like the same version. I gave every one of you a brand new, right off the factory floor, new iPhone, all the same model, same operating system. Everything is identical. And I said, here, just play around with it. And just, it's yours. A week later, I check all of your phones. Obviously, the basics, you know, the software and the operating system and some of the basic features, it's all going to be the same. But there is going to be plenty of variety in terms of how you organize it, uh, obviously what apps you have, obviously your own pictures and stuff like that. So schema, there's the, the it's how your brain organizes data. Most of the time, we have a, a pretty predictable pattern of this, but not always. Now, the context effect. Your brain, I often make it sound like your brain's just guessing, and it is to a degree, but it doesn't mean that your brain is guessing without using some data. Just like, you know, a jury member, they may have some level of bias and personal stake and opinion, but I would like to think that they would at least use some context of the evidence that is presented at trial to sway their decision. And so just because your brain, your brain can land on a lot of different ideas, but that doesn't mean your brain doesn't go with the most likely result based on what is also around to help your brain understand. So it's basically, it's called the context effect. It's essentially the same idea as context clues that you learn about in something such as English class. And so let me give you an example of some context effect. So for example, if I just showed you this right here, you might see it as a B, you might see it as a 13. But if I give you context, it helps it better to understand. Like, it'll be 13, which one's right, which one's wrong? Neither. It's ambiguous. But if I only showed you the A and the C, it would be hard for you not to probably then go ahead and see as a B, because now I've provided some context. However, if I got rid of the A and the C, and instead I gave you a 12 and the 14, now the context has changed, and now you'd likely see it as a 13. So your brain often uses context clues to better judge what it thinks is supposed to happen. However, sometimes context clues actually make it harder on your brain, not easier. Let me give you an example of that. So this um, is called Fraser's Lines. Now, the context in this case is actually messing up your brain's ability to see it correctly. I've actually given you too much information, so I don't know if all of you see it this way, but you should see that these lines um, definitely fall like are, are, are not straight. They look like they're an angle. They look like, like some kind of Donkey Kong level, but they're not. They're actually perfectly straight parallel lines to each other. In this case, the context is actually wrecking havoc with your brain's ability to see it correctly. So in this case, the context is not helpful. So it's actually hurting your brain. Here's another good example of where context can actually mess you up. This is called the mueller liar illusion. Now, for most of you, again, maybe not all of you, but for most of you, line A should look longer than line B, but it's not. But the context of the prongs on the end are making it distorted. And your brain's taking those contexts and going ahead and using them to make an assumption that in this case is wrong. Now, can the opposite be true? Can your brain ignore context that it doesn't like or doesn't believe is helpful? Absolutely. Here's an example where your brain actually will ignore environmental context. Now, if you have stared at this picture for a while and have never seen this optical illusion before, read what it says. And even after that, I bet some of you said, well, it says a bird in the hand. I don't get it. Well, if you haven't figured this out yet, take a look at it again. It says a bird in the, the hand. Now, don't be, don't be surprised and don't be ashamed if you, it, I had to point it out to you. Because you'd be surprised, I think it's about 70% of people the first time they're shown this image, uh, one study showed about 70% of people the first time they were shown this image, they did not understand what the point of this was. Now, in this case, your brain, uh, the environment gave you context. It gave you words, a bird in the hand. It gave you accurate context. Now, it didn't give you an accurate sentence, 
but it did give you accurate information. But your brain's like, I don't like information that doesn't make sense. So your brain basically psychologically erased one of the thes because it doesn't help. This is a good example of like a simple example of what we call confirmation bias. When you believe something about a group of people, believe something about a real politics or something about religion or something about the news, something about this or something about that, any information that comes up that disagrees with what you believe, your brain basically says, don't pay attention to it. Don't pay attention to it. Don't pay attention to it. But it definitely pays attention to every single study and every single thing that ever comes out and says, look, it's on our side. It's what we believe. Remember this. So in this case, your brain is just ignoring accurate context because it's not context that makes sense. So it's there but it's not something your brain enjoys, so it gets rid of it. Uh, another example of context obviously goes with uh, the more context you have, the better off you are. So if I say just name a word, that doesn't give you a lot of context. If I say name a word that ends in IRE, that narrows your context. If I say finish this um, sentence, it gives you a lot more context. Uh, another example of this is your brain is really lazy. And it will basically take in as little context as possible and still get itself to the right answer. And this is an example of that. So there were people that were shown large paragraphs of words um, where every, every, basically every word in the sentence that was at least four or more letters long, every single word, the first letter and the last letter were put in the correct spot but every other letter was jumbled up inside the word. When they had people read the sentences, most people, they noticed, it never slowed them down at all. Okay, fine. Most of you can probably do that. However, what they also found interesting, many people didn't even notice that things were misspelled until they pointed it out to them. Most, now, don't get me wrong. Plenty of people did notice that the words were jumbled up. But most of them, it didn't slow them down much at all. But some people, not only did it not slow them down, they didn't even notice there was a problem until it was pointed out to them. And that is because, and a simple rule, much like we are, our brains are also lazy. Our brain often is like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to stop you right there. I've seen enough. Like, I know where this is headed. I, I, don't, I don't need to see anymore. And so... Your brain just goes ahead and does that. So as long as the first letter and the last letter is in the right place, your brain's like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's why often you could proofread your own paper over and over and over again and never, never catch the error. Like without, without some kind of, um, without some kind of word check, um, with a spelling check, without somebody else reading it for you, you might, you know, uh, you know, you have people that publish things in the newspaper with misspelled words and you're like, how, like how, like how did this get past so many people? Well, this is one of the reasons probably why. All right. Last thing, uh, pareidolia. That is a weird sounding word, which is good because this is a weird sounding phenomenon. And I'm going to give you some examples. And then I highly, highly, highly encourage you to go to the internet because there are whole Instagram uh, dedicated to pareidolia. There are whole Reddits dedicated to pareidolia. There are whole Pinterest dedicated to pareidolia. There are websites dedicated to pareidolia. Pareidolia is when you see stim like you see basically stimuli. You see especially images inside images that already exist. Like you you see stuff in stuff. So a simple example of pareidolia is when you can look at the clouds. Last I checked, clouds are clouds. They're a thing. But then you see stuff in the clouds. And you're like, oh, that looks like this. Or, oh, that looks like that. That can be pareidolia. You see the man on the moon? Congratulations. You just committed pareidolia. You see a pattern in some randomness? Congratulations. You just committed pareidolia. So pareidolia, by far and away, the best example of pareidolia is faces. The ability to see faces in everyday objects. So if you go online, you will see pareidolia where they will show you inanimate objects. They will show you 
uh, fruits and vegetables that had, you know, interesting growths. You'll see rock formations. You'll see trees. You'll see pieces of uh, machinery. You'll see uh, kitchen sink faucets. You'll see, you know, over and over again, they'll show you all kinds of stuff that have faces. And it's hard not to see them once you start looking for them and you go onto these, like I said, these Pinterest pages or these Reddit pages or these Instagram channels. At, and I'm sure you can find YouTube videos that just show you a bunch of pareidolia um, over and over and over again. And I mean, a simple example they have found of pareidolia is the faces of cars. Cars have faces. Um, you can't put a, you know, a grill and then two headlights on the front of a car and not expect people to somewhat see it as a face. And they have found that car companies, not always, but sometimes purposely make the faces of the car to look in the way they want consumers to feel and look at the car. And then people sometimes buy accordingly. So one good example of this is sports cars. Sports cars. Take a look. Like, like, just look at a bunch of sports cars. Look from the front. Look at a bunch of sports cars online. They are meant to look angry and aggressive because that's what the car company wants them to go for. They want them because the kind of people that would probably buy an expensive sports car, they want to be seen as someone who goes fast and is very aggressive. So the cars look like they are angry and aggressive. And that is how they are designed on purpose. Um, so that is called pareidolia. And again, there are so, so many am examples of pareidolia everywhere if you know you're looking for them. And then, so again, I encourage you, I highly encourage you, check out some Pinterest pages. I just go, just go to Google and type in either pareidolia examples or type in if something even simpler, type in faces in everyday objects. I promise you, you will find pages with pictures upon pictures. And like I said, it's, you can't unsee that once you see them, um, because faces are such a critical function. We see them everywhere. Um, so anyway, we'll even talk about pareidolia later this year from a psychological standpoint because we will use Rorschach ink blots. Um, they are still used today as a psychological diagnostic tool in some cases. You know, they just give you some ink splatter and say, do you see something here? And if so, what it is? And, and why do you see what you see? Well, it depends on the psychologist you ask. Anyway, that's it for this video. Again, please check out some of the stuff I have mentioned online. I would love to have shown you more. But again, I don't want to get this thing uh, banned for copyright related issues. But again, look, check out the description below. Look at some of the videos. Uh, search for some of these things. It'll definitely be worth your time. Um, it's definitely a rabbit hole you could spend some good time in. But that's it for this video. As always, if you have any questions, please let me know.